He gave me life. He saved my sisters. And I couldn't ask for any more. Anybody who was related to us in Poland had died at the hands of the Nazis. And we were the only ones that survived. And the reason we survived is because we ended up on Schindler's list. The allure of Oscar Schindler is in his ambiguity as a human being, the ambiguity of his motives. He saved them not because he was, at the beginning, kind-hearted, good, noble, moral, and the like, but because, uh, on a very deep level, he developed a human attachment to these people. You know, he bribed everything. He did everything with money or with gifts or whatever he did. And he accomplished it. He was, to us, he was an angel. In 1980, in Beverly Hills, California, Australian author Thomas Keneally walked into a luggage store to replace a travel-worn suitcase. The owner of the shop, Holocaust survivor Leopold Page, told Keneally an amazing and somewhat unbelievable story. About German, Nazi, a drinking, womanizer, um, profiteer, who saved 1,300 Jewish life, children, women, and men, and I noticed that he was interested in this story. I knew that uh, the story of Oscar had all the right uh, ingredients it, because people love paradox and the paradox of the scoundrel savior is one of the contradictions that people most love that chance meeting led to schindler's list a best-selling award-winning book from that came an oscar-winning motion picture by steven spielberg that would be seen by hundreds of millions it's a tale of a man who'd witnessed the enormous evil perpetrated by his own people. A man who found the humanity and courage to oppose it. Oscar Schindler's life began on April 28, 1908. Oscar was born and raised in Zvitao, Czechoslovakia, part of an area known as the Sudetenland. Svitao was just over the German border, and many of the townspeople, including the Schindlers, were of German descent and considered themselves German. Oscar was the oldest of two children. He had a little sister named Elfrida. They loved each other dearly. His mother, Louisa, like other mothers of the day, ran their middle-class household. Though the family was Catholic, it was only Louisa who practiced the faith. His mother was the characteristic misused Catholic woman married to a somewhat philandering, um, fun-loving, boozing father who had a small factory in the town. Outside of work, Hans Schindler's interests lay in coffee houses where he would smoke cigars, sip cognac, and socialize with friends. Hans's young son, Oscar, was honing his own social skills. Oscar was learning how to manipulate people. With both his parents, Oscar Schindler probably got away with everything short of murder, because he got away with everything short of murder when he grew up, and uh, I'm sure that uh, applying the same charm to his parents uh, served him well. An important influence on young Oscar was a Jewish family living next door. He went to grammar school and played with their two boys. Ordinarily, a friendship between neighbors wouldn't be significant. In this case, it was. Schindler regarded Jews not as alien others who could be easily stigmatized, but as human beings who are like us, who breathe like us, who laugh like us, who cry like us, who grieve like us, and the recognition of the other person as a human being and not as a stereotype 
uh, means that you're capable of establishing human relations with them. In his teens, Oscar was uninterested in academia, though he did finish high school. The mechanical know-how he'd gained in his father's farm machine factory led to tinkering with Hans Schindler's motor car. Later, Oscar turned to motorcycles. He loved the speed, the sense of danger, and he thrived on being in the limelight. He was participating in the car races, and he was a very good driver and even got lots of award as a driver. In school, he was in every play, and he has to have the major role. And he was charmer, and the girls was after him. Oscar had many girlfriends. Then, in 1928, at the age of 20, he appeared to settle down. After a whirlwind courtship, he married a gentleman farmer's daughter named Emily Peltzel. Emily had been schooled in a convent and was as reserved as Oscar was reckless. Oscar received a sizable dowry when he got married. According to Emily, he soon bought an expensive car and squandered the rest. He wanted to be rich and he wanted sexual gratification, quite frankly. Uh, so they were his ambitions. A good time, he had the ambitions not of a philosopher, but of a hedonist. In the early 1930s, Oscar entered the military, serving in the Czechoslovakian army. He hated the rules and regulations and got out as soon as he could. After his military service, Oscar returned to Emily, but only in theory. By day, he worked as sales manager at Moravian Electrotechnic. At night, instead of going home, he lived the life of a bachelor, staying out and carousing in the cafes. It appears that his father had a big influence upon him. His father was an unsatisfactory husband, as Oscar was, and Oscar was appalled by his father's behavior towards his mother. But then, of course, as so often happens with us fellas, he went on and reproduced the behavior of his father in his own relationships with women. In 1935, when Oscar was 27, his father abandoned his mother. There was no divorce. Three years later, she died, alone and brokenhearted. Oscar was devastated. At her funeral, he refused to speak to his father. He'd never forgiven him for leaving his mother. It was during this period that Oscar surprised friends and family by wearing a swastika. He had joined the Nazi party. He got involved in the Nazi party because it was good for business. He wanted to make a lot of money, and he did make a lot of money. As the National Socialist Party in Germany continued to expand under Adolf Hitler, newcomers were avidly sought after. Oscar signed on with the Abwehr, the German intelligence agency. The Abwehr sent Oscar to crack off Poland, to pose as a businessman and gather information on the Gestapo and the German army. Like most regimes, the Third Reich had its share of factions and rivalries. Oscar looked forward to his mission. He saw Krakow as a city full of possibilities. On September 1st, 1939, the Nazi Blitzkrieg stormed into Poland and began its brutal occupation. One week later, Oscar Schindler, 31 years old, arrived in Krakow as an agent for the Abwehr, the German intelligence organization. His disarming smile, quick wit, and ability to disguise a bribe as a gift of friendship helped make all the right connections. He didn't go into World War II thinking, I'm gonna save Jews and be a hero. He went into it thinking, I'm gonna make a lot of money and be set for life. The Krakow that Schindler came to exploit was a bustling industrial city with a thriving Jewish community, 66,000 in all. 
But when Hitler's armies invaded Poland, the Jews of Krakow, as well as Poland's other three and a half million Jews, were soon set apart from the rest of society. The Nazis decreed that all Jews, over the age of 10, wear the Star of David, a Jewish icon. The Nazis followed a very specific pattern which was to take the population that was defined as Jews, to isolate them, to stigmatize them, to confiscate their assets, and to make it impossible for them to continue with a normal human life and to exploit their assets. Schindler witnessed Nazis evicting Jews from their apartments at will, herding them into ghettos, then moving into their vacant residences. The Nazis also took over their businesses, retaining Jewish workers as slave labor. Schindler had the full privileges of a Nazi, and he understood he could benefit from the Jews' misfortune. He began inquiring about a formerly Jewish-owned factory on the outskirts of Krakow. On the advice of Itzhak Stern, a Jewish accountant he'd met, Schindler decided to take over the factory with Stern running the books. Schindler was convinced he could acquire lucrative military contracts by producing field kitchenware and mess kits for German soldiers. From their first meeting, Schindler and Stern formed an immediate bond. When Schindler turned their conversation to the war, to the rampant killing, to religion, Stern saw an opening to plant a seed. He expressed a fine point of Talmudic wisdom. He who saves a single life saves the world entire. The remark was not lost on Schindler. Schindler purchased the factory from the bankruptcy court of Krakow. He borrowed 50,000 zlotis, the equivalent of $10,000 from several wealthy Jews who realized the Nazis would get their money sooner or later. They took their chances on Schindler. DEF, Deutsche Emil Fabrik, known by its workers as Emilia for short, soon became quite a success. Schindler, the operator, made the deals. Behind the scenes, he relied on his staff. Schindler had the business sense and the heart to treat his Jewish laborers humanely, often with a smile, a joke, or an unexpected kindness. He came to my workstation and called me by my name and uh, occasionally asked me things, not because he wanted to really have the information, but he just wanted to make human contact with somebody like me, 13 years old. And then I'd find out the following day that when I went to get my ration of soup that I was supposed to get two rations because Schindler had ordered double ration for me. That's the kind of person he was. There was even more compelling evidence of the fact that Schindler was different from the other Nazis. He warned his Jews of upcoming auctions, calculated incidents in which the Gestapo would terrorize and kill Krakow's Jews. A kind of covenant developed between Oskar Schindler and his prisoners. It was a very rough covenant, but it basically said, you run my factory and keep things chugging over, and I'll keep the dogs and the jackboots and the lash and the rifle off the factory floor. As a result, Emilia earned a reputation as a haven from Nazi brutality. Krakow's Jews sought to work there, and Schindler was all too eager to accommodate them. For taking on more Jews made good economic sense. Although the Jews themselves weren't paid, Schindler still had to send their wages to the SS. But at just six marks a day, about two dollars apiece, Jewish labor was a better deal than higher-priced Polish workers. While Schindler defied Nazi law by treating his Jews humanely, he also broke the rules of marriage. Schindler kept his wife Emily back home, far from Krakow, where he had countless sexual liaisons with a German mistress, his Polish secretary, and many other beautiful women. 
He was a sexual omnivore, and he could never get enough of women. Women could never get enough of him. He was a powerfully built man. He was very attractive. He smelled good. He looked good. He exuded sexuality, and he had no self-control. Emily Schindler was always hopeful that he would reform, that somehow he would come around. She was also a very devoted Catholic because we asked why she didn't divorce him. She said, no, I couldn't. I wouldn't hurt my parents by divorcing him. Besides, I love this man. I love this man. And why you were not jealous? No, when he will have only one girlfriend, I will be extremely jealous. But he has hundreds. So how could I be jealous about hundred women? Emily's joke belied hurt feelings about her marriage. She often argued bitterly with Schindler about his many lovers. Schindler's endless pursuit of beautiful women never seemed to distract him from the plight of his workers. They commuted to his factory from the Jewish ghetto where conditions were abysmal. Schindler was well aware of their misery and learned of the Nazis' plan to liquidate the ghetto. On March 12, 1943, Oskar Schindler told us when we arrived at work there that we will not be going back to the ghetto that particular evening. The reason for that is that there is trouble in the ghetto, there is shootings, killings, and a, a liquidation of the ghetto going on, and we would be better off staying here until this is uh, over with. The liquidation of tens of thousands of Jews from the Krakow ghetto certainly had a powerful emotional effect on Oskar Schindler, who witnessed it. He would have seen beating, he would have seen dogs biting, he would have seen officers cruelly whipping and screaming and shouting and bludgeoning. Every imaginable form of destruction, including mass shootings, would have taken place at that moment. You know, a war profiteer can tolerate an awful lot. Wartime is a difficult time for everybody, but that may have been the moment when it became too much and when he recognized that something awful beyond description, beyond recognition, beyond articulation was taking place, and that may be the moment that um, changed him. Those Jews who survived that night were sent off in cattle cars to death camps like Auschwitz and Treblinka. It was all part of what was being called Hitler's final solution. Now he knew that there was a grand strategy to actually rid Europe of these people, to treat them as a virus which would be totally eradicated. He knew they weren't a virus. He knew that because he knew Stern and he knew those kids he played with as a child. Schindler's Jewish workers were sent to a brutal existence with 12,000 others at the slave labor camp at Plashoff. By day, they continued their efforts at Schindler's factory. When the work was over, they returned to the desolation of the camp a place where summary and mass executions were common. Plashoff was run by Commandant Amon Geth. According to survivors of the camp, Geth was a monster. It was no life. We were waiting for death. He was killing people on random before they went to work. Terrible memories I have when thinking that he was coming back through the yard whistling a happy tune. He was content, like a content animal. He loved to see blood. He was training the dogs how to attack people. It's very hard for me to talk about this because if it, it, it was terrible. He would give out an order to the big one, to the white rap, and the dog would hop on people and tear them apart.
This was the man with whom Schindler ate and drank and bonded. But the relationship had a dual purpose. Oscar Schindler had a plan to get his Jews away from Ammon Geth. In 1943, the Nazi regime's lethal assault on the Jewish people was in full force. At the Plashoff slave labor camp, Commandant Amon Geth gave free rein to his murderous impulses. And yet, despite this brutal environment, Oscar Schindler spent many festive evenings in Geth's villa overlooking the camp. Oscar was able to drink with the devil, to make deals with the devil. That's because there was a lot of the devil in him as well. If Oscar hadn't been that particular blend of satire and black marketeer and drunk and savior, he couldn't have saved them. He had to be that particular blend of contradictions to be a savior in a world where all values were upside down. To Helen Jonas Rosenzweig, a Jewish maid at Geth's villa, Schindler's close relationship with Geth and his concern for Jews was confusing. Oscar Schindler came down into the kitchen and he took me to the window. He says, you see the people down the hill they carried stone, they were digging the hill. He said, look at them, watch them. You see people in Egypt, you Jewish people, when they were enslaved, and then they were freed from Egypt. This is what's gonna happen to you, you will see. You won't be free from that hell. Schindler soon began to make good on his promise by taking advantage of his close relationship with Geth and other high-ranking Nazis. Schindler received permission to build a barracks camp next to Amalia. He'd convinced them that his Jews would work harder and longer if they didn't have to commute from Plashoff. The workers themselves benefited as well. They were now out of Geth's deadly jurisdiction. Those people really were saved from beating, hanging, killing that was taking place in Camp Plashoff. Emolia was now a self-contained concentration camp. That made Oscar Schindler the director of a concentration camp. Nonetheless, he provided extra food, medical care, and other necessities that were unheard of in other camps. These special services were expensive, but Schindler could afford them. He was making a fortune on the black market, selling surplus items from his factory. Under German law, Schindler's black market activities were illegal, but so was his humane and cordial treatment of his Jewish workers. On one occasion, he had his birthday party, and some of the inmates uh, baked a cake, and uh, a little girl, a young girl, was, took it up to the uh, office and gave it to him. So uh, he gave her a kiss. And this, of course, was a major crime uh, during that period of time. Schindler was subsequently arrested. It was one of three separate arrests, but he was able to talk and bribe his way out of all of them. He was playing a dangerous game. This is a big operation. He does it openly. He, as a German citizen, is violating their laws openly. He does it at great personal risk and great personal expense. And finally, with no expectation of reward. In the spring of 1944, Schindler and his Jews had to adapt to changes in the war. The Russians had been steadily advancing on the Eastern Front and the Germans were retreating. The Nazis ordered all camps and subcamps in Plashov and Krakow be emptied of their workers. Schindler could have easily walked away a wealthy man at that point, but he knew what would happen to his Jews if he did. Instead, Schindler went to Berlin, where he received authorization to move his Jewish factory workers 
to a new location in Brinlitz, a town nearby his boyhood home of Svitao. He convinced the Nazis that his new factory would manufacture ammunition by getting his activities and Jews reclassified as essential to the war effort. He hoped to spare his workers from the gas chambers at Auschwitz. Everyone who would go to Brindlitz with Oskar Schindler had to get on his list. A list that meant life. The Jews called it simply Schindler's List. Some 1,100 workers were lucky enough to get their names on it. They were Jews from Schindler's Amalia factory, as well as the Plashoff labor camp. Schindler was even able to make good on his promise to Geth's maid. He said, give me the names of your sisters. And that's how my sisters came along with me. The uh, names were put on the list. I really didn't know about the list. The Jews on Schindler's list didn't go directly to Brinlitz. There were two frightening detours. At first, the 801 men were routed to the Gross Rosen death camp. 300 women were sent to Auschwitz. When they saw the smoke billowing out of its chimneys, they understood the camp's deadly purpose. They put us in the shower room, and we are standing there quite some time till we know what is going to come down, or it's going to come down water, or it's going to come down gas. Are we going to get killed? Are we going to get gassed? We didn't know. That was the most horrible minutes. I don't know how long it was. For me, it, it was very, very long, but it probably wasn't long. But it, every minute was a year. And then came water, it came water. Schindler knew all too well he had to get his Jews out of Grossrosen and Auschwitz. Two of the women had already died there. In this rare interview clip, Schindler explains how he saved his Jews from a fate that so many others had met. Da habe ich ungefähr vier Wochen gekämpft. Die waren inzwischen mit anderen nach Auschwitz transportiert. It was a struggle to get the women out of Auschwitz. It was a miracle that I had them released after four weeks with a list of names. Naturally, it required interventions, telegrams, and journeys to Berlin and Auschwitz. Es würde zu weit führen, wenn man die Details diesen Kampf. We arrive. The men from Grossrosen arrive in beginning of November. By the end of November of 1944, he brought the women from Auschwitz, the 219. And he said to, I remember like this was yesterday, thank God you are with me. Hot soup is waiting for you. In the months to come, Oskar Schindler's increasing humanitarian efforts on behalf of his Jewish workers would far eclipse any endeavors toward personal gain. By January 1945, the war was going badly for the Nazis, and defeat was imminent. Adolf Hitler was nonetheless determined to complete his self-proclaimed mission to resolve the Jewish question. The Nazis had nearly succeeded in exterminating all of Europe's eight million Jews. Oskar Schindler was at cross purposes with the Nazi regime. He had brought some 1,100 Jews to his war essential factory in Brinlitz, Czechoslovakia. Schindler had now been joined by his wife, Emily, who'd come from their nearby hometown, Zvitau. Emily was as horrified as Oscar of the Nazi atrocities. When Emily joins her husband full time at the factory in Brinlitz, Czechoslovakia, she was an integral part of the operation and helping people survive. While Emily's motives for feeding, supplying, and looking after the Jewish workers at this time were primarily humanitarian, Oscar's reasons were still ambiguous. If your workers are working for you and they are profitable, it is in your economic self-interest to keep them near you and to keep them in conditions that are less grievous so that they're more able to function. 
Although Schindler may have begun his wartime endeavors in 1939 as a profit-minded businessman, an incident in January 1945 indicated that at this point in his life, his humanitarian concerns far outweighed his financial motives. Two cattle cars carrying 132 Jews were on a hellish odyssey that began at a Nazi stone quarry in Goleshov, Poland. The prisoners had been turned away by several death camps. Ironically, they were too full and too busy killing people to take them in. After 10 days without food, water, or blankets, the frozen prisoners were abandoned at Brindlitz. Oskar Schindler came to their rescue. So we have to cut out with the uh, welding equipment the doors to remove them. And unbelievable things what we saw. We saw people's death, 16 of them. There were 132 people in the two cattle train. These people were looked after by Oscar and Emily. And the fact that those carriages, those trucks were opened, the fact that these people were brought onto the floor of Brinlitz and the fact that their lives were saved, uh, the fact that Oscar bought a, uh, a plot from uh, the local uh, parish priest for the burial of those who died, uh, all this is an eloquent statement to the honour and benevolence of the Schindlers. As the cattle car survivors were all in poor health, not one of them worked a single day at Brinlitz. And yet for the next five months, Schindler paid the Nazis over 600 marks a day for the 116 Jews he'd taken in. This act alone spoke volumes about the man Schindler had become. On the eve of May 8th, 1945, Oskar Schindler had important information that the Jews in his care had waited five years to hear. Schindler asked us all to gather around. He stood up on something high, and he told us that uh, we, were, we were free. The war is over. The Germans have surrendered, and that he was going to leave, and these guards who were standing around behind him were going to leave as well, and he wished as well. Everyone there was in, either in tears or in laughs or trying to crawl toward Schindler to kiss him and thank him personally, which was impossible to do with a thousand people. It was an emotionally charged uh, gathering uh, where we just uh, were short of being able to express our feelings, the unbelievable achievements that we have survived the war, and it was Oscar Schindler that uh, brought us to this point. The 12 or 1300 Jews Schindler had saved would soon learn of the extent of the Nazi Holocaust. Six million other Jews had not had an Oscar Schindler to come to their aid, and they had perished. From that moment on, it was Schindler's Jews who would spring to action on his behalf whenever necessary. We, the survivors, the people who Oscar Schindler fed and protected for four and a half years, knew when the Russian will take camp of ours, he as a German, as a Nazi, as a profiteer, as a manager of the concentration camp factory, he will have not have a chance to survive. Schindler, the former Nazi war profiteer, was now disguised as a concentration camp survivor. Eight of the Jews he'd rescued spirited him away to Allied forces in the West, where he was able to surrender without repercussion. Oscar and Emily traveled to Munich and pondered the future. He was 37 years old and faced the turbulence of the post-war world. Germany's economy was a shambles. So were Oscar's finances. Despite the millions he'd made during the war, he'd walked away a pauper. Schindler was undeniably a hero, but outside of the survivors who owed him their lives, no one knew 
or cared. After the war, when the drama was gone, he was adrift. He was afloat from one business venture to another and basically was a sybarite who lived to have a good time. Schindler soon acquired enough money to start a new life. In 1949, a Jewish organization awarded him $15,000. It was the first of many financial gifts bestowed upon him by a grateful Jewish community. That year, Schindler moved to Buenos Aires, Argentina, where he, Emily, two mistresses, and three families he'd rescued attempted to rebuild their lives. Oscar Schindler's post-war life, like everything that had preceded it, was a study in contrast and ambiguity. There were times of great joy and extended periods of despair. While all of his business attempts in Argentina were failing, he always managed to find the time and the money for beautiful women. These activities came to an end in 1957, when Schindler was bankrupt. The following year, he left his wife, Emily, to fend for herself and returned to Germany, never to see her again. In Frankfurt, Schindler lived in a one-room apartment overlooking the train station. Whenever he received money from various Jewish organizations, he would leave the squalor of his apartment and live the high life for a while. In 1961, after a number of failed business ventures in Germany, Schindler went to Israel at the invitation of a group of Jews who were among those he'd saved. 800 people greeted him at the airport. At the time, Adolf Eichmann, the architect of Hitler's final solution, was being tried in Jerusalem. The Israeli press learned of Schindler's wartime heroics and played up the obvious contrasts between these two former Nazis. The German press also filed stories about Schindler. So when he returned to Germany, his fellow countrymen knew all about what he'd done during the war. He was condemned by the Germans, a, a traitor. He saved witnesses to the truth. 1,300 of them, children, women, and men. And they are alive, and they will talk, and they will tell the truth. While the Nuremberg trials had held accountable many of the Nazi leaders, like Hermann Goering and even Amon Geth, who were both executed, there were millions of former Nazis who'd escaped punishment and returned to civilian life. Schindler's fellow countrymen called him a Jew kisser. They threw rocks at him. No one would do any business with him. There was even an attempt on his life. Schindler contemplated suicide, but didn't want to give his enemies the satisfaction. Schindler's spirits were lifted when he returned to Israel on April 28, 1962, his 54th birthday. He'd been invited to plant a carob tree in the Garden of the Righteous at Yad Vashem, Israel's memorial to the Holocaust. Schindler was also awarded a medal. It was inscribed with the Talmudic verse he'd heard two decades earlier from Itzhak Stern. He who saves a single life saves the world entire. In 1963, an article on Schindler's heroism brought his story to the attention of MGM Studios, which optioned it for $50,000. As he did whenever he got money, Oscar spent it quickly. The MGM film was never made. Oscar Schindler's former factory workers eventually began calling themselves Schindler Juden, Schindler's Jews. They felt a lifelong bond to the man who rescued them. In 1968, survivor Leopold Page and others established a foundation that would provide for Schindler for the rest of his life. Schindler Jude Leon Lason was at a Los Angeles reception held in Schindler's honor. He recalls his emotional reunion with the man who'd saved him, his parents, and two of his four siblings over two decades earlier. 
I reached out my hand and started to introduce myself because I realized, you know, I was a, a grown man. And last time he saw me, I was not yet 15, you know. So he interrupted me. He says, I know who you are. You're little Mason. Schindler had many heartfelt reunions with those he'd saved. For the rest of his life, he returned annually to Israel to celebrate his birthday on month-long visits paid for by his Schindler Juden. They were wonderful times that by all accounts seemed to be the highlights of his post-war life. He felt in Israel every time he was invited like a king. He was accepted like the most important person. And he was cherished by those people, loved by the new children, by the new generation. In 1973, Schindler told Page he wanted to be buried in Israel. The following year, on October 9, 1974, Oskar Schindler died of a massive heart attack in Frankfurt. He was only 66. The devastating news traveled quickly to Schindler Juden throughout the world. We cry was a tragedy for us pers personally. And I sometimes was asking myself, did we did enough for him? That we fulfilled the obligation? Maybe yes, maybe no. I try my best. The Schindler Juden collected the money to have his remains brought to Israel. At the dedication of his Israeli gravesite, 500 survivors paid last respects to their hero and savior. But Oscar Schindler lives on. People have a choice in their lives. And Schindler is an example of it. He was a Nazi, but he was a good person. His story teaches children everywhere they can choose not to grow up hating those who are a different religion, nationality, or race. They can look to Oscar Schindler as a noble example of doing right and opposing those who do wrong. He's an indictment of the generation of perpetrators. He belies the truth that they think they tell when they say, well, everybody did it, we had no choice, we couldn't have done otherwise, there were no alternatives. You point to Oscar Schindler, there were. He made a difference, and he made a difference when it counted. <laughs>